grace and peace. It's good to see you once again this week for our weekly Bible study. I'm excited for what God to say to us today, and I'm also excited about what God is doing in our lives. We serve an awesome God, even in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, God is good. He is still blessing us tremendously in our lives. And I am excited about what God is about to unfold and manifest yet again in the midst of this moment which we are living. So I'm excited to come to you and to bring you uh, this Bible study, this word of God that I pray will bless your life as it has already blessed me in just studying and praying over this word and getting prepared for what God is going to do. And perhaps you're like me, you need to speak to you in the midst of this season to give you a word to help you survive, to help you to thrive and to walk into the abundant blessings of God. So um, I'm an optimist, I'm someone that walks by faith and not by sight. So no matter what season we're in, I'm content and I'm looking for the hand of God to move in my life. Um, we're studying the book of Mark. We're in the gospel of Mark. We're still in chapter one. Today, we're gonna to look at Mark chapter one, verses 16 through 18. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. We're going to look at just three verses today to speak to us. Um, we're taking our time going through the book of Mark to be thorough, to look at the life, the ministry, the theology of Jesus through the lens of the Apostle Mark. Uh, thank you for your prayers. I wasn't on last week as I was recovering from some oral surgery. Looked like I had a ping pong ball in the side of my mouth. I was all jacked up all kind of ways, uh, but thank God for healing and divine recovery from oral surgery. I can talk and I can eat and uh, sleep without pain, so I am grateful. Also wanna thank everyone who reached out to me on Facebook uh, through the mail to help me celebrate my 49th birthday. I'm so grateful for God allowing me to see yet another year. So I just want to take time to thank everyone who uh, hit me on Facebook, show some type of random act of kindness, or just took time to give me a birthday shout. I tried to respond to everyone, but there were so many I just couldn't keep up. But thank you once again. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, and thank you for tuning in today. Chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, reads as follows from the uh, King James Version. And it says, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Uh, when the Gospel of Mark chapter one, verses 16 through 18, the Gospel of Mark, verses 16 through 18. Uh, this is indeed a dynamic uh, piece of scripture that we're looking at for our Bible study this week because we find uh, Jesus apprehends these disciples while they're in the midst of their daily routine. And this is one of the things that I, I, I love about how the Lord reaches us and touches us in our daily lives is that he reaches us in the midst of our regular routine, that he apprehends us, that he reaches out and touches our heart um, many times when we're not expecting it. 
and sometimes he takes us in directions which we not anticipate on going. So we find here when we look at Mark chapter 1, verse 16, as the text unfolds, we discover that we often have opportunity with Jesus in the midst of our daily routine. We have opportunities with Jesus in the midst of our daily routine. And I think that's relevant for us because many times people are looking for these divine moments of supernatural activity for the Lord to move or speak to them in our lives. But one of the things that I've discovered in my life and walking with the Lord is that some of my greatest moments with the Lord come at times that are a part of my daily routine. I find that the Lord is always present and active in my life, but I have to take time to notice him sometimes in the very small things in my life. In my life, A lot of times we look for God to move through the supernatural. We look for God to move in these grand uh, fashions and ways. But many times if we just look at the subtle things of our daily lives, here we find Jesus moving, speaking, and granting us opportunities. Here we find these two fishers, uh, Andrew and Simon, going about their daily task, their daily vocation. And here comes an opportunity with Jesus that comes into their midst. And I think the relevant question arises to us today is what opportunities have we missed with Jesus in our daily routines? What opportunities have we overlooked because we were so busy? I was on a phone call today with uh, an elder from my former church in Columbus, and she and I was talking, and um, I was telling her, I, I thank God for this this COVID-19 season. Uh, unfortunately, we've had people that have become sick, people that have passed away, but God always brings something good out of something bad. And I said, this gave me an opportunity over the last four months to put my life on pause and just hear God speaking and watch God moving in some areas that I otherwise would have missed because I would have been busy traveling to conferences, conventions, meetings, revivals, different things. Um, But now that my focus has been apprehended, I hear some things from God that I might have missed otherwise. I see some things God is doing that I might have missed. So I think we as humanity and as believers have to always be on high alert and look for our opportunities with the Lord in our lives because many times he speaks to us. He gives us uh, opportunities to have relationship with us opportunities to experience moves of God in our lives if we just take time and pay attention and don't miss them. Uh, also, I think when we look at this text at how Lord was with Simon and Andrew in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, how he comes into their lives, how he selects them to be enlisted into Jesus. It shows us that the Lord is looking to use and empower ordinary people. He looks to use and empower ordinary people. The sad commentary on life is that many times we discount our own existence and we discount our own potential because we think that the Lord can't or will not use someone like us. And sometimes I just sit in awe at how God has given me opportunities and how God uses me in my life and in my ministry. Uh, I never forget where I came from. Uh, You know, my first church back in the 90s was a very small church in a place called Bandana, Kentucky, in Ballard County, Kentucky. I started out with 
seven members in a country setting, a very rural setting. And from there, the Lord opened doors, opportunity for me to grow and bloom, to be on national and international platforms. And sometimes it's very humbling. It's humbling every time when you think about how God would use an ordinary person like me to do some things that he's blessed me to do in my life. And so I exhort to you, never discount yourself, never discount what God can do in your life um, because God specializes in using ordinary people. Here was Simon and Andrew in the text. They were fishermen. They were fishermen, but yet the Lord was pulling them into his inner circle. They were being invited into the inner circle of the Son of God, the inner circle of the Messiah. Here they were getting an opportunity to walk with Jesus. These two ordinary fishermen, people that probably didn't stand out in the crowd. We don't know how lucrative um, their fishing business is. Scholars give no hint or suggestion of whether they had a large fishing outfit, whether they were two small independent fishermen on a small boat, or whether they were over a group of fishermen. But what we do know is that fishermen were ordinary people. They were blue collar workers. They were ordinary people in Jewish society, but the Lord handpicked them for a divine assignment. So I raise this question to us today. What excludes us from considering the fact that the Lord may put his hand on us for a divine assignment. I contend today that your life is not out of reach for the Lord to use you in his service. So you have to endeavor to be at a point in your life of where you are open and receptive that God might do the unlikely in your life. And I contend that is the narrative of God because many times I have seen God do some things in my life that is so unlikely. I would have I would have never imagined uh, in a thousand years that when I started on this journey in ministry or even before ministry, that I would be preaching to people overseas in South Africa, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I never imagined that I would be preaching in national platforms at conferences and conventions, that I would be used by God to mend broken lives. And so I contend that just as God has used me, God wants to use you in your life. And you have to realize your value in the kingdom, that God will use you, that you are a likely candidate to be used in the kingdom of God. So when we look at this passage of scripture in Mark chapter one, verses 16 through 18, with the life of Simon and Andrew, God gave them an opportunity to be used in the kingdom. He specializes in using ordinary people. It doesn't matter what your level of economics may be, what your level of education may be, what your level of spirituality may be. When the Lord decides to use you, he can hand pick you, empower you, and anoint you to be used in the kingdom. Um, this is also interesting when we look at this, this biblical narrative from Mark of how Andrew and Simon were called into kingdom service because they were fishermen by trade. They were fishermen by trade. They were not um, from the religious culture. They were not cut from the religious cloth. Even when you look at scholarly writing, uh, there's no evidence that these men were deeply entrenched in religious culture, but Jesus chose them. They were fishermen by trade, but yet the Lord imparted a call and anointing upon their lives to be used in the kingdom. And this is what I like about 
God is that sometimes God brings us from varying, diverse uh, avenues of life and brings us on the same platform to use us for the glory of God. You don't have to be someone that was always raised in the traditions of the church. You don't have to always be someone that knows the traditions, the rules, the regulations of the church for God to use you. But sometimes God likes to just take a raw human product like us and use us in the kingdom for his glory. And I'm glad that sometimes he uses ordinary people, that he uses diverse people in the kingdom, because what that does is that brings and broadens the kingdom perspective of how we bless the lives of others and how we approach ministry and how we witness to others in the kingdom of God. So here we find in Mark chapter one, uh, verses 16 through 18, we find that God specializes in using ordinary people. And as I said earlier, never discount yourself, never discount yourself, because no matter what your background may be, your baggage, no matter uh, what limitations you may have right now, I declare and I decree that God can use you whenever and however he decides to use you. He, he will use you in the kingdom because I, I will say that if he can use someone like me with my baggage, with my issues, past, present, and future, that he can also use you in the body of Christ. Uh, what I like about God and, and what we find also from this text in Mark chapter one is that there is not a predetermined profile of who the Lord will use in the kingdom. Diversity is a strength of the kingdom. There's not a predetermined profile. So a lot of times we discount ourselves and eliminate ourselves from being used by God because we will look in our own mind and say, I don't fit the profile. Well, you know what? I didn't fit the profile of being a bishop. I didn't pro fit the profile of being a doctor, a doctor of the church. I didn't fit the profile of being a pastor, of being a husband, of being a father decided to use me in those various capacities. So we have to understand that it is often a trick or scheme of the adversary of the devil to get into our minds and our hearts and our spirits. And we will tell ourselves, well, I don't fit the profile of who God wants to use in this particular area. God knows who we are and God wants a diverse body of people to come into the kingdom to be used by God. He needs people that come from a church, traditional church background. He needs some people that don't come from a church background. He needs male. He needs female. He needs conservative. He needs charismatic. He needs democratic. He needs Republicans. He needs people of all persuasions to be used to give him the glory and to expand the kingdom. So when we look at Andrew and Simon as fishermen being called by Jesus early in his ministry. These were, these were, these were two of the first um, disciples called by Jesus. Uh, this is amazing because he reaches out to people that didn't come from royalty, that didn't come from a religious lineage, but he reaches out to common, ordinary people, individuals, common fishermen. He says, come unto me, come follow me on this journey of ministry. So this is dynamic. And I think this ought to really expand our evangelistic scope of ministry, because sometimes even in witnessing and evangelizing, we want to focus on a certain type of demographic. But when we look at Jesus as an example, he had no boundaries as to who he touched. He touched a tax collector. He touched fishermen. He, he touched uh, lawyers. He touched a, demon a demonic man that was filled with demons running in a, in, in a cemetery, in tombs. He touched a lame man. 
a crippled man sitting by the pool of Bethesda. So there's no reason for us to exclude ourselves from being called, anointed, and used by God in the kingdom. So I don't care what people have said about you. I don't care how people have minimized your existence. Uh, you have to declare unto yourself that I am a perfect candidate to be used by God. I remember when I first started out in ministry uh, 29 years ago, there were some individuals um, that said I, I wouldn't make it because I just didn't have what it took or what it takes, I guess, for ministry. I remember an individual that I was raised around, respected like a father or grandfather, looked at me square in the eyes. Bless his soul. He's gone on to glory now. But he looked at me square in the eyes and he said, John, John, you're not going to make it in ministry because of A, B, and C. And he wasn't even really a church person. But I'm glad that the boundaries and limitations that people place on our lives are not concrete and don't have authority over our lives. But I'm glad that when God decides to use us, my God, he can use us however he wants to use us. So here's some key principles. Let me give you some key principles in this Bible study today uh, to following Jesus. Because when we look at the text um, in verse 17, it says, and Jesus said unto them, come ye after me and I will make you of men. I will make you to become fishers of men. So we see here that Jesus is saying to Simon and to Andrew, come ye after me, follow me, follow Jesus, follow your Lord and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, what we have to understand in following Jesus, it is not just a physical walk. It's not just saying, I'm going to follow him. Um, but following Jesus, following the Lord, making him Lord of your life requires transformation. It requires reconstruction of your life. It requires divine submission in your life. I cannot follow after Jesus and not have submission in my life to he and his principles. I cannot follow after Jesus and not allow my life to be conformed to the ways of Christ. Yes, we will not be perfect. We will have some issues. We will have some struggles, but I am working and living out my sanctification, what we say in our Baptist doctrine, our sanctification, and allowing my life to become more like him after I am following him. So here are some key principles to following Jesus uh, as, as gleaned from the text today. The first thing is we must possess a capacity to hear his voice. We have to have a capacity to hear his voice. Andrew and Simon had to hear him speaking to them, speaking into their lives, challenging them, inviting them to follow after him. He had to, they had to hear his voice. We have to be careful in our lives as believers not to tune out the Lord not to tune out the Lord. And a lot of times we tune out the Lord because we allow distractions to come into our lives. We allow distractions to come into our lives and to uh, cause us to tune out the Lord. So you have to be careful about what you allow or who you allow to come into your atmosphere because if it is always causing chatter, distraction, and confusion, then you will never be able to hear God speaking in your life. While Andrew and Simon were doing whatever task was involved with them being fishermen, they heard the voice of Jesus say, come after me. How many times in our lives have we missed the voice of the Lord because we allow distraction to invade our atmosphere? 
We allow chaos to invade our atmosphere. We allow people to come into our lives and our atmosphere that should have never been there. And because of their existence, we didn't have a capacity to hear his voice. I encourage you today to understand that the Lord is always speaking to us if we are willing and able to hear him. He never stops talking to us because that's who he is as God. He is always speaking life into a dead world, speaking life into the body of Christ, speaking life into the life of the faithful. He never stops speaking, but sometimes we are not able to hear his voice because of our relationship with him, of where we allow things to come between the Lord and us, or because we allow distractions to come into our atmosphere. So the first principle in following Jesus, when we look at Mark chapter one, verses 16 through 18 is, we have to have the capacity to hear his voice. We have to hear his voice. And let me share this with you. I've discovered in my own walk with the Lord, my own spirituality, the most important thing in my life is to hear the voice of the Lord. And sometimes to do that, you have to push some people, some situations away from you so that you can hear the voice of the Lord. And let me share this with you. Don't apologize for creating divine space and atmosphere in your life. So I'm going to say that again because somebody needs to put that in your notes today. Don't apologize for creating divine atmosphere and space in your life. Sometimes I wake up in the mornings and I just want to spend my first hour or two communing with God hearing from God, talking with God, trying to get divine revelation, getting in the word. And when I do that, I don't have time to sometimes return a phone call, answer a phone call, respond to a tweet, a message, get on Facebook, respond to a text message. Sometimes I just need a good hour, hour and a half, two hours, maybe a half a day just to be in the presence of God, to hear his voice. People shouldn't be so consumed with you and you so consumed with them that you never can create an atmosphere for divine revelation in your life. Sometimes you need to declutter your atmosphere and your your ears and your heart so that you can have some time with God. It, you know, as soon as your feet hit the ground, you shouldn't have to be on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, phone calls, or whatever you do, emails, you know, everyone needs to take some time to just hear from God when you start your day or at some point in your day. Don't be afraid to block out 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, half a day, just so that you can hear from God. Because sometimes your relations with other people might even get better if you learn and they learn to give you some time alone with God. OK, if, if your life is so um, if your life is so consumed with situations, with family, other people that you can't exist for a few hours or an hour or 30 minutes while someone tries to commune with God, then something's wrong. Don't 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 be that thirsty. <laughs> don't be that thirsty. But you have to have a capacity to hear God's voice. And the number one reason why we don't hear God's voice is because we are distracted at times. We are distracted at times. The second thing we find, the second thing we find as a key principle to following Jesus based upon the scripture first uh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter one, verse 16 through 18. The second thing is a willingness to walk in obedience. Andrew and Simon heard the voice of Jesus. They, they received the invitation. Now all they had to do was be obedient to his voice and say, now we're going to walk after Jesus. We're going to come after him. We're going to respond uh, to his divine invitation. And the hardest thing that we have to do sometimes in the kingdom 
is to walk in obedience to the Lord and to those who have divine or spiritual authority over our lives. As humans, I believe there is something that is irrevocable in our DNA based upon um, based upon Genesis chapter three that causes us to gravitate to disobedience. We, we want to rebel. If you go back to Genesis three, the Lord said to Adam and Eve, you can live in paradise. Just don't mess with this one tree. Don't eat this one fruit. And what did they do? They went to the one tree. They ate the forbidden fruit. And now the rest is history. They were expelled from the garden. We all have the blood of Adam in us. We all have a sin nature. So I think we have to understand one of the key principles to following Jesus is we have to have a willingness to walk in obedience. If Jesus says, come after me, we have to be obedient enough to walk after him. If he tells us to live our life for his glory, we have to be in obedience to that. If we are instructed to live, live our life according to word and let the word be a lamp unto our feet. We have to be obedient to that. So uh, obedience is the second key to following Jesus. The third uh, key to following Jesus, and I like this one, is a willingness to step into the unknown. Jesus never told Andrew and Simon where they were going. He just says, come after me. He never told them. Follow me from point A to point B. Follow me from Galilee to this place. He said, just come after me. And I find and believe that is one of the challenging things that we have in the kingdom today is stepping into the unknown with God. Um, we want to be in such control of our lives, such control of the kingdom. We need to know every detail of what God is doing. Tell me what it is. We need to take a vote on what God said. The devil is a liar. <laughs> the devil is a liar. Um, if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to have a willingness to step into the unknown. And that brings up the relevant question. Do we trust the Lord enough? Do we have enough faith to follow him into the unknown? Uh, I, I've never read anything from Genesis to Revelation that says that the Lord has to explain to us in advance where he's taking us and how he's taking us there. He just says, come after me, follow me. So we have to have a willingness to step into the unknown. Perhaps the only thing that is holding back the lives and the destiny of so many people is a willingness to step into the unknown, to show that you trust God enough to follow him wherever he is taking us. I don't need the Lord to give me a road map of where he's taking me in order for me to trust him. But I'm willing to do as Andrew and Simon were commanded in the text in Mark 1, 16 through 18. I'm willing to come after Jesus. I'm willing to follow him, not knowing where I'm going, what the outcome is going to be. And that doesn't really matter because I don't need to know it because I know him. <laughs> That's a word for someone today. You don't need to know it because you know him. Stop questioning the moves of God in your life and just trust him. Stop worrying about tomorrow. Stop worrying about how it's going to come about. Stop worrying about whose idea it was. Just follow God and see what he does. Okay. Uh, the fourth thing, the fourth principle is a willingness to attempt the ill, the illogical, the a willingness to attempt the illogical. Uh, the invitation really, in a sense, didn't make sense. Jesus said to these fishermen, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. They were fishermen by trade. They knew casting nets into the water that they would catch fish 
out of the water. But now Jesus is telling them, Jesus is non-fisherman, this carpenter, telling them, come after me and I'll make you fishers of men. So so what, what does that mean? They're going to cast nets into water and pull men out of the water? What, what, what does it mean to be fishers of men? So they had to trust, watch this, an illogical move of God, a carpenter telling fishers he's going to make them fishers of men. Jesus, who they really weren't that acquainted with at this point, if at all, telling them to leave their livelihood, to leave their station in life and come after him. Jesus telling them, I'm going to make you fishers of men, something that just doesn't make sense. Um, so if we're going to follow after Jesus, we have to have a willingness to attempt the illogical. We have to be willing to trust God enough to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something for God, even if it doesn't make sense. I have to understand that sometimes God will give me a piece of revelation for my life, for your life, uh, that doesn't add up. Has God ever, has the Lord ever told you something crazy? Has he ever told you something that seems so out of the box that it didn't make sense to you? Um, so, what we have to understand is that sometimes the Lord specializes in doing things that are not logical. And some people try to operate in their lives with logic over faith, and it just doesn't work that way. I'm not saying that we have to come to church and shout and praise and leave our mind at home. I, those of you that sit under me or have sat under me at, at any particular church know I'm going to exegete a text every time I get up to preach. I'm going to exegete a text. I'm going to break that scripture down. I'm going to give you the historical context, the social context. Um, I'm going to give you everything about that scripture I can that speaks to your intellectual capacity. But then at some juncture, I'm not only going to give you things that speak to your intellectual capacity, but I'm going to give you some divine revelation from God as to what he's saying in your, in your, into your life. And it might not make sense. God has told me some things that didn't make sense. You know, I, I, I was very, very comfortable in Columbus, Ohio, but God spoke to me and said, you about to go to Rochester, New York. I had never been to Rochester, New York, but I trusted God. Um, I told folks years ago uh, that I was going to drop a certain amount of weight that I would become slim and trim and in shape. And they would laugh and giggle and I'd laugh and giggle with them. But into 2020, I've dropped 63 pounds. So sometimes God moves and specializes in some things that are not logical in our lives. And one of the things that hinders us in our progression in our lives is that we are always trying to make sense out of what God is doing in our lives. But when he spoke, to Andrew and Simon in our text today in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, he was saying stuff that didn't make sense. He was telling fishermen, uh, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They never heard of being fishers of men. What What is that to be fishers of men? How is this carpenter going to tell us he's going to transform our fishing? But it was the son of God. So what we have to understand is that when we follow Jesus, sometimes we have to be willing to attempt the illogical, to believe in things that don't make logical sense. Um, as I said earlier in the previous principle, to trust God enough to step into the unknown. And the final principle I have is a willingness to experience 
reconstruction and transformation in your life. A willingness to experience reconstruction and transformation in your life. That's what Jesus is saying to these two soon to be disciples in the text in Mark chapter one. He's saying, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. Previously, they had been fishers of fish. They go out in their boats, they cast the nets, they catch fish. That's how they live. That's how they made their livelihood. Now Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you fishers of men, which means I'm going to do something different in your life. I'm going to transform you in your life. And here's the interesting thing I find in the kingdom is that everyone talks about change, transformation, uh, making us over reconstruction. I want God to do a new thing in my life. We start talking in tongues. We start crying. We start snot coming out, slob coming out. We rolling in the floor talking about we, we're going to experience change in our lives. But here's what happens. Every time we get in that process of God shifting our lives, of God transforming our lives. And because we don't know what's going to happen, because we don't see what's going to happen, because we can't comprehend how God is going to do something new in our lives, or if it looks like he's going to do something that we don't want done, we begin to fight against that transformation. We begin to resist that reconstruction in our lives. We begin to become rebellious, we become angry, we become frustrated in the midst of that transformative experience in our lives. But watch this. If God is going to reconstruct and transform our lives, we have to have enough faith to trust his process. You can't get in the middle of a divine transformational process and then fight against the Lord and everyone else because you don't like how things look. Things always look bad, but when God gets through working in the situation, he always works it out. So we have to have a willingness to experience reconstruction and transformation. So the five principles to following Jesus, let me recap them real quick for those that just jumped on or if you're taking notes, is number one, you, we must possess a capacity to hear his voice. We must possess a the capacity to hear his voice. And I said, we can't allow ourselves to be distracted. We have to sometimes uh, push circumstances, situations, people away so that we can hear from God, have time with God. Everyone should strive to have 30 minutes, an hour, whatever you need, two hours, maybe a half a day, just to have some time to commune with God. You know, your Twitter, your Facebook, your texting, your email, your Instagram, your TikTok shouldn't be so important that you allow it to invade and dominate your atmosphere that you can't hear from God. Principle number two was to be obedient. When we hear the voice of God, we have to be obedient and submissive to that voice. Principle number three was a willingness to step into the unknown. Jesus said to Andrew and Simon, come after me. He didn't say, where are you going? He didn't say what you're going to do. He said, come after me. So we have to have a willingness to step into the unknown. God doesn't have to tell you everything he's going to do. You just have to trust who he is. The fourth thing is a willingness to attempt the illogical. And the final step is, or final principle is, a willingness to experience reconstruction and transformation. Let me break down this last verse and then we're done for the day. Verse 18, and straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Many times in order to follow Jesus, we must be willing to leave our former lives, people, things, and baggage behind. The text says in verse 18 that Simon and Andrew forsook their nets. That means they left their nets behind to go after Jesus. Let me say that one more time. They left their nets behind 
to go after Jesus. They heard the voice of Jesus say, come after me. And immediately, once they heard his voice speak to their lives, they left their nets, they put their nets down, they left the fishing boats, and they came after Jesus. They had a willingness to say, I need Jesus more than I need what I currently have. <laughs> and that's the problem that some people have, is that we think what we have, we need more than Jesus. We think situations, we think that people, we think things that we cling to and we hold on, we need more than the Lord. Uh, I used to hear a saying, Millet Milliken, when I was a kid, and people would say, all I need to do is um, be black and love God and die. And that's so true. You know, all, all you need is God. All you need is God um, in your life. But sometimes we have to be willing to leave some former things behind. And the problem that so many people have in their lives is that we cannot separate ourselves, divorce ourselves from the things in our past the things in our present, and maybe even some things that are creeping into our future in order to get what we need from God. So I thank God for, for some things that I left behind me. I thank God for some people I left behind me, people that I thought were friends that I couldn't live without. Uh, I thank God for some people um, that I thought loved me and I thought I loved them. Uh, I thank God that I left some of them behind. I'm grateful for some people that walked out of my life that I couldn't walk away from uh, because my life is so much better empowered. My atmosphere is so fresher now. Uh, so perhaps you need to take an inventory of your life, of friendships, of relationships, of life matters that you are holding on to the baggage and the hurt from that you need to let go of so that you can be liberated to walk into a new life or the newness of Christ. And I contend it's not the devil that's holding so, some people back. It's not the devil. Let me say it one more time. It's not the devil that's holding some people back. Stop lying on the devil. As a Christian, you ought not lie on the devil. And some of you lie on the devil and say, the devil this, the devil this. The enemy's attacking me. The enemy's holding me back. No, it's not the enemy. You holding yourself back. Because as a believer, we have divine authority in our lives. So you ought to start walking in it. As I said earlier, you shouldn't be so thirsty in life for certain situations, certain people, certain circumstances that you can't have time with God, that you can't hear his voice, that you can't follow after him. So I've learned in life in 49 years that if I'm going to get to where God wants me to be, then I have to make a conscious decision to leave some things behind. Simon and Andrew could not follow after Jesus carrying their boats and their nets. That's why the text says they forsook their nets and followed him. They were willing to have enough faith, Connie Phillips, to say, I'm going to walk away from my former life and my former things, and I'm going to trust God. Wow, that's deep. Many miss their destiny moment because they are not willing or strong enough to leave some things behind. What if Andrew and, and, and Simon in the text didn't have enough faith to leave their nets, to leave their fishing careers? What if they would have missed their divine moment and opportunity with Jesus to become his disciples, his friends? to become two of the 12, all because they didn't have the strength to leave their nets behind. They could have said, all we know is fishing. All we know is these nets. 
And Jesus, now you're asking us to leave these nets behind. They could say our, our circle of friends are associated with these nets. Our circle of friends are associated with our fishing business. We can't leave them. How are we going to leave them for you? We just met you. We just encountered you and we've known them for years. That's the struggle that a lot of people have is that you have to have enough strength. You have to have enough faith to leave some things behind. And I, I want to share this with you. Sometimes we think of everything we will lose by leaving some people behind. But I want to transform your thinking. Stop thinking and considering what you're going to lose and leave behind but start thinking about what you have to gain. <laughs> Think about what you have to gain. Sometimes it's good to have a moment of reflection in your life and think of all of the blessings and opportunities you would have missed if you would have failed to move when God said move. When, if you would have failed to follow when he said, come after me. OK, following Jesus in closing, it requires sacrifice. It requires sacrifice. When we look at this text, when when Jesus said, come after me. And I will make you to become fishers of men. It wasn't simply becoming connected to Jesus and being friends with Jesus. They had to trust Jesus enough to leave their livelihood to leave their business, to believe that Jesus would provide for them, that every need would be met financially, emotionally, spiritually. They had to have enough faith in Jesus to leave family behind, to leave friends behind, to leave familiar surroundings behind. They had to have enough faith in Jesus to believe it was more to be gained with him than what it was in the world. Have an increase of faith in your life. Trust the Lord enough to where your life is not driven by people around you. That your life is not driven by circumstances around you. I can never leave this town because it's my hometown. I can never leave this place because I've been here forever. I can't live without this person or that person. Yes, you can. <laughs> Follow after the Lord. Following Jesus requires a sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice to follow Jesus today? Are you willing to sacrifice human relationships? Are you willing to sacrifice what is familiar and what has you content? Are you willing to sacrifice the opinions of others? Are you willing to make sacrifices to follow Jesus. So I hope this Bible study has been helpful to you today in Mark uh, chapter 1 verses 16 through 18. If you jumped on late, you can replay this on um, Facebook. I'm also going to download it onto our band app as soon as I'm done. Uh, for those that follow us on band app um, within the Enon Church. I want you to know that um, we're praying for your life. We're praying for your destiny as a ministry. We pray that God will continue to bless you abundantly. Uh, so grateful for how God is blessing people in the midst of this season. Uh, I know we're in the midst of a global pandemic, but watch this. this. This is how God is moving. As I talk to people, I'm hearing more testimonies of victory and triumph than I am of defeat and despair. So God is just such, he's, he's, he's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. Uh, pray for us as a church, the Enon Missionary Baptist Church in the midst of this COVID-19 virus. We are um, still blessing souls, saving souls, reaching the community. Uh, this Sunday, we will have communion service uh, at the church. We ask that you arrive 
uh, around 9.10. It's going to start promptly at 9.30. It's going to be totally, totally different than how we did it the last time. We did it outside, and uh, we had a few little hiccups uh, with the, the unexpected crowd, but it's going to go a lot smoother this week. I promise you that. So we hope to see you at 175 Genesee Street. Spread the word if you are a member of Enon. For those that uh, want to partake of Holy Communion, arrive at the church a little after nine so that you can receive instructions. You will receive a communion kit uh, upon your arrival, and then uh, you will be directed uh, to join me at the altar uh, as we engage in uh, Holy Communion. So uh, park your car in the St. Mary lot, the other big overflow lot. Uh, we will still have our drive through on Sunday for those that want to come to our drive through and get a word and a prayer. Uh, each Sunday from 10 to 1130, uh, we have a drive through worship encounter. Our volunteer staff will give you a printed word from myself uh, that has a devotional message. Our clergy are there to pray over your life um, for whatever prayer request you might have or just to receive prayer. If you want to drop off your tithes, offering seed, you may also do that. But the focus is upon a word and a prayer. So we just want to bless your lives and continue to touch your lives in the midst, in the midst of this uh, global pandemic. Uh, keep our sister churches in the city. Many of them are open already. Uh, we're not quite there. We do have a plan, so we are prepared, but uh, we're still just trying to watch the news and get reports. Um, during the month of August, I think on the 13th and 27th, if my memory serves me correct, those are Thursday evenings at 630, uh, we're going to do a couple of outdoor worship encounters on the front lawn of the church like we normally do in August of every year. But we're going to do two of them, uh, the 13th and the 27th. I'm going to preach a word on both days. We're going to have music. We're going to be masked up. We're going to keep our social distance and give God the glory and take worship to the street. We're going to take worship to the street and let the community worship with us on the 13th and the 27th. Those are two Thursday nights at 630. And we'll get more information out to you on that. Also, um, I'm excited to announce, um, and I kind of alluded to this on a robo call, we're going to have a life series webinar coming up, um, shooting for the last week of August, uh, dealing with a variety of topics, uh, parenting through a global pandemic, uh, equipping your child for educational success. It's, it's crazy now trying to navigate this educational journey with our kids with online learning. We don't know yet here in New York uh, whether we're going to be in school live or kids going to be doing virtual. But we want to offer to you a, a little 30 minute webinar on parenting through a global pandemic uh, equipping your child for educational success. Also, we want to have a uh, webinar on how to transform your prayer life, how to transform your prayer life. Uh, we're going to have another webinar on marriage maintenance, marriage maintenance during a pandemic. Uh, so this will be for all of our married folk. Also, we want to have something for our millennials of our church and those that follow us entitled Millennials and Faith During Times of Social Change. So we want to speak to uh, our millennials about the importance of faith, the relevancy of the church in the midst of these times of social change. And then uh, our last webinar will be Youth for Christ in Challenging Times. Um, I asked Minister Jermaine Johnson to just come with a word, he and maybe some of his staff, to just talk to the young people. So we want to have these five webinars uh, in late August that will be coming to you along with the two outdoor worship services. And then also, uh, there'll be some exciting news coming forward on Sundays, every Sunday in August from 9 to 9.30 on the front uh, lawn of the church. We're going to have, I'm going to have Solidarity Sundays. 
uh, Solidarity Sunday. So I'm going to have a special keynote speaker from the community that is going to come uh, each week and speak to a certain topic. Uh, let me give you those real quick. Uh, our issues in our city are surrounded by education, economics, poverty. So we wanna speak to these issues. So on August the 2nd, uh, we wanna talk about blacks and education. August the 9th, we wanna talk about blacks and economics. August the 16th, we're going to talk about black solidarity. We just need to come together as God's black people and work together. August the 23rd, we're going to talk about black poverty. And August the 31st, we're going to talk about black voting and public policy. And we'll have special keynote speakers. Um, most all of them are confirmed. Dr. Leslie Meyer Small, our new uh, superintendent of schools. Uh, Malik Evans, who is a city council person, one of our own from Enon, is going to talk about blacks and economics. Uh, Councilman Willie Lightfoot will be with us talking about black solidarity. Uh, someone I'm very proud of, Brother Damon Meeks, one of our members of our church, my frat brother, and he is the assemblyman elect. He's going to talk about blacks and poverty. And then uh, hoping on the last uh, Sunday to talk about uh, black voting and public policy, how we need to actually go out and vote and be a part of shaping public policy. Uh, hoping to have Dr. Cephas Archie um, to come and speak on that day, just from 9 to 9.30 each Sunday in the month of August. But I'll have more information coming out uh, during this time. Yes, sister, maybe our time is progress during a pandemic. Yes, we're going to make some progress. Uh, but once again, thank you for tuning in. Keep myself, keep me in your prayers. I need your prayers. Uh, very busy today. Uh, have some training videos to tape after this. We should hopefully uh, within the next uh, week or few days have new members training online. I'm going to video that in just a few minutes. And then also some leadership training videos I need to do for our church that we will have on the band app. So pray for me. Thank you for tuning in to this Bible study today. Um, we pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you during this season. Uh, and we look forward to you just coming out and being a blessing at the Enon Church. Once again, we're looking forward to communion service. Good to see so many of you online. Uh, childhood friends I've seen online today from my hometown in Paducah, Kentucky, I've been tuning in. People from literally every church that I've pastored um, have been online. So if you just jumped on and you missed us today, go back and replay it. I'm going to post it on uh, Facebook. And then I'm also going to download it on the band app. Good to see my friend, Pastor McDaniel in Columbus, uh, jumped in here at the end. I need a favor, Pastor McDaniel. I need you to go to Jay Alexander's over in Eastern Town Center and get me a slice of, uh, um, what's that pie? I like that key lime pie. Yeah, you know what I like over that key lime pie at Jay Alexander's and then drive over to the FedEx office and FedEx it sort of get here before nine in the morning. So hook me up, man. Hook me up. <laughs> but God bless you all. Love you all in Jesus name. And I pray that God will bless you and pray for me in the midst of this busy day of doing videos and discipleship and equipping the kingdom. God bless you.